ladies and gentlemen, uh, the first session will discuss a number of themes, but uh, I have, uh, unfortunately, a couple of people who can't attend. The Reverend Fred Nile was going to come. He comes to every meeting that he says he will come to. He's a strong supporter of Australia as a constitutional monarchy. Unfortunately, he's involved in uh, a court case of some crucial interest for his party, and uh, that's going on for a couple of days. It was to have been finalised last week, but it's continuing into this week, so unfortunately he won't be here. So uh, we will go ahead, and uh, when Ken Handley arrives, he'll come and sit here. And uh, we, have, uh, we have on the stage, we have Warwick Stacey, who's, uh, who's had a really remarkable career, the gentleman on the left. He's sitting on the left for once in his life. Uh, Warwick has had an extraordinary career. He was born in Australia, spent his youth in Australia, and then spent 15 years overseas. Eight years of which was with the British Army in the Parachute Re Regiment and uh, the SAS. And uh, then he came to Australia. He spent a number of years in the Australian Army in reserve. He, has, uh, he was an officer, but uh, doesn't want me to mention that, the rank that he holds, because obviously he thinks that's uh, pretentious. But he then went into international crisis management. He was dealing with ransoms and kidnappings and Somali piracy and all sorts of fascinating things like that. He is, in fact, our very own James Bond. So welcome, <laughs> Warwick <laughs> Stacey. And uh, sitting next to him is Sean Burke. Sean Burke has had a background in journalism and senior management and board positions on a number of very important international media organizations, including PBL Media, EMAP PLC, and Reed Elsevier. He's the founder and editor of the very successful political newsletter, Politicom. And if you don't get Politicom, do subscribe. It's, there's no charge. It has an enormous rating. And it's very up to date on political affairs. In addition, he has extraordinary skills in relation to graphic design, and he's a wonderful worker and has all of the all of the promotional material for this conference, which I think you'll see going up on the screen, is his work. That one, for example, which you see now is his work, and he did a number of them, and uh, they are very effective. Now, that is not turning over, so I, I will ask, uh, I'll ask Brendan if uh, he can help me with that. Do I, which one do you click? Good. And if this gets into your eyes, we'll have to turn it off, but if it's causing a problem over there, we will turn it off. And we're waiting on uh, two, two uh, people to join us, but uh, they will be coming. Ken Handley, who was a judge of the Court of Appeal in New South Wales, he was such a good judge. He was in demand in other Commonwealth countries. He'll be here in a few minutes. And we'll put him on the, uh, on the panel. As I say, we're, we would have been delighted, we were delighted that Fred Nile indicated that he would come, and unfortunately he can't because of... Ken's here. Oh, Ken's coming, good. But uh, I'm mentioning uh, Fred, uh, Fred Nile. Ken, I've just taken the liberty of introducing you. <laughs> you don't mind, I'm sure. Do come up onto the stage when you can. This is a national conference of Australians for constitutional monarchy. It's the 22nd since the referendum, and ACM is rather proud of the fact that we are the only organisation... You can come round there, there's a staircase. You're so brave. 
It's the 22nd since the referendum. We're the only organization in the monarchy republic debate to have held a national conference every year and to tackle the really serious issues. ACM, in case you don't know, was established in the 90s. In fact, the, the man who established ACM is, Peter, is coming along uh, later on this morning and he'll be on the stage and we'll be able to talk to him about uh, the events that led up to that. In the, in the convention election, after John Howard decided to go ahead with putting the question of a republic to the Australian population, in the convention election, Australians for constitutional monarchy won 72% of the monarchist vote. There were four other smaller monarchist organisations. Immediately the convention was held. They formed a united front and agreed on virtually everything. So there was no division among the monarchists at the Constitutional Convention. There were great divisions among the Republicans at the Constitutional Convention, so much so that one group, the real Republicans, in the actual referendum became effectively our allies in the no case. ACM went on to lead the no case. We had uh, pop-up officers in every state. We had paid directors in every state, usually qualified people in matters of politics. And we managed to win nationally. The vote was 55%. But if you counted, and I must thank Ken Handley for this, if you counted the informal and the people who didn't bother to vote, you would see that those who were uninterested in constitutional change, didn't want constitutional change, came to a very high 50s. Close to 60% of Australians actually weren't interested in a republic in 1999, although the official figure is 55%. But we also won, and as you know, in a referendum, a referendum has to be won nationally. It also has to be won federally. It has to be won in a majority of states, that is four states. It wasn't won in one state. We even won in the state where we thought we were the weakest, that is Victoria. And we were fortunate in Victoria, we had a director who advised us in relation to winning the case, and he gave us superb directions. He was Rick Brown, and there, there is, if, you, if you're interested, there is a video of an interview, a series of interviews I did with him on our channel, our YouTube channel, which is Monarchy Australia. If you go into those and look at those, you'll see how well he advised us on how to win in Victoria, and he gave us really marvellous advice. He also was the one who designed one of the mottos. All of the mottos of the no case, all of the mottos of, of the no case in the referendum were designed by ACM, except one. One was designed by Alan Jones, and I'll tell you about that when he comes at 10 o'clock. All of the others came from ACM, but but the really good one, the one which probably had the most effect, was vote no to the politician's republic. Vote no to the politician's republic. You will be surprised, you'll be astounded to know that for some reason, Australians don't like politicians. <laughs> and vote no to the politician's republic was, was a winner. And that was a fair motto because that motto described the model because it was the only model of a republic. The only republic, not only in the world today, in, but in history, in which a prime minister could sack the president without notice, without any grounds whatsoever, and without any right of appeal. It meant, of course, that the president would be turned into a puppet of the Prime Minister, and uh, many of us think that that was deliberate. Anyway, that was something which was crucial 
in the referendum and vote no to the politicians who public caught that. We tried to have the question changed. The question was, are you in favor of Australia becoming a republic in which the president is elected by a two thirds majority of a joint sitting of the Houses of Parliament? We said it should also say, and dismissible by the prime minister without notice, without grounds of appeal, and without any, any uh, right of appeal. But they wouldn't do that. Malcolm Turnbull turned up to the same, to the same committee to try and get the, uh, the question changed. Malcolm Turnbull wanted two words changed in the question or removed from the question. One was president. He wanted head of state because he knew that head of state works better in getting votes than president. The other word that he wanted to remove was astounding. He wanted the word republic removed from the question. Does Australia become a republic? He wanted that changed or removed. He said it wasn't necessary. You immediately knew that all his focus groups were telling him that the question, the word republic, was a bit on the nose with Australians because they thought of the American Republic and other republics in history. And if they wanted change, they were a bit wary about republic. So he wanted the word republic removed. But such was the reaction, even in the Republican press. They ridiculed him for three days. He was a, he was a national joke over wanting to remove republic that after three days, he withdrew his proposal to change that. Well, ACM, unlike some of our rivals, is not housed in luxury. We're, the only money we spend is on, uh, on campaigning. ACM remains under the charter. We have a charter. It's worth looking at. It's on our website. It's very much a broad church charter. It's not a narrow group of monarchists, royalists. It is much broader than that, and it's worth reading that. And as uh, Tony Abbott says, we are the fiercest defenders of the Constitution. Our motto sums up our mission. Our mission is to preserve, to protect, and to defend the Australian constitutional system, the role of the Crown in it, and our Australian flag. I would suggest that if ACM has qualities, it particularly has two qualities. We're serious and we're constant. Take the crucial issue of head of state. It's only crucial because the Republicans make it so. What the Republicans want to do is to load the question, the referendum question, with the additional words, Australian as a head of state, suggesting we don't already have that. As you probably know, from the sort of research over which Ken Handley, QC, former judge of the Court of Appeal, has effectively presided, that's a lie. We already have an Australian as a head of state. And that's crucial. We know, we know that Australians aren't lying awake at night, wondering who their head of state is. But we know that this will be used in any referendum. In fact, it's used in any poll. If you go and look at the opinion polls, for example, there's one company, Essential, they changed their poll after Peter Fitzsimons commissioned them to do a private poll, they changed their question. It used to be, are you in favor of Australia becoming a republic? Look at their site now. Are you, in are you in favor of Australia becoming a republic with an Australian as head of state, with an Australian as head of state? If you look at the polls, that's worth 8%. 
it pushes up the yes vote by 8%. The opinion polls went up by 8%. Now, in a referendum, that'll be crucial. If they put in those words and we don't challenge them, it's the difference between winning on 51%, that's a narrow win, we won on 55. But even on 55, we could still lose if they put that in the question, because if you're winning on 51 and they change the wording, according to essential polls, you go down to 43%. That's why the Republicans are always going on about the head of state. That's why Ken Handley and a whole team of experts, lawyers and those experienced in uh, vice regal practice, lawyers who know something about constitutional law and international law, all conclude that the Governor General is the Australian head of state and that the Queen is the sovereign. And uh, Ken has presided over the publication of articles in learned journals, in respected journals, and also it's been included in a number of books. That shows you how serious ACM. The other thing is we're absolutely constant. We will change our minds if facts are different. But for example, on the head of state, we always argued this. We argued it in the yes, no booklet. We were asked to write the first draft of the yes, no booklet. The yes, no booklet is approved by the politicians who support the yes case in relation to the yes case. And the politicians who voted against the referendum, they have to approve the no case. But we actually wrote the first version and we made the important point in the early part of this that we already have an Australian as head of state. I think it's absolutely important that all monarchists understand that and don't go along with this fiction that the Queen is the head of state. The Queen is not the head of state, she's the sovereign. We do not use her as the head of state. Head of state is a, as in describing an office, in actually having an office called head of state, that's an office under international law and it is the country concerned who decides who their head of state is. Every Australian government, no matter how much the politicians may lie about head of state, in referendums, every Australian government, coalition or Labor, always represents the Governor General when he goes overseas on a state visit as the Australian head of state. And that is absolutely crucial, though, as we say, we, we know, of course, that uh, Australians aren't wondering, lying awake at night wondering who they are. So that is essentially what ACM is about. And we have a number of themes we're discussing at this conference. I won't come to the first theme because that will be, that's the theme about uh, restoring constitutional government in emergencies. That's the theme which will be more for the next session. And uh, what I think I will do now is invite one of our young ambassadors, Daniel LaHood, to tell us the question which he would have asked of Reverend Nile. And when we ask questions, we're asked to go to where, where Daniel is going because that's where we can film you and then it can easily appear in the film. Daniel. Did you want me to talk with a microphone? Yes, you need a microphone, so take one from here. Just press the button. If uh, Reverend Nile was here, I would have posed the question to the panel, which maybe the panel could answer this question, although uh, Reverend Nile is absent. 
I've seen photos of the 1996 ACM demonstration in Macquarie Street over the car government throwing the governors out of government house. You were on the platform, well, Reverend I was on the platform. There must have been anywhere between 20 to 30,000 people there. I understand the Republicans, with all their resources, have never ever been able to mount one successful demonstration. Does that mean all of the passion, emotion, and indeed belief is on the monarchist side? So you ask whether all of the passion is on the monarchist side. I'm wondering if members of the panel might have any views on that. There's a microphone there, if you want it. I think all the common sense is on the monarchist side. <laughs> um, my, I mean, I spent a lot of, I've got a microphone on my little hell, thanks. Um, I spent a lot of time sort of trawling through, looking for good stories, and it, you can always find a crazy on the on the um, Australian Republican uh, YouTube, not YouTube, um, Facebook pages. Um, they're passionate, but I think they're misguided. Um, the arguments they put up are, are illegible. Um, you know, things like. Catholics and Muslims rise up because you're not allowed, not allowed to be head of state because the Queen's Anglican. I mean, come on, that, that's that's a that's a that's a pre-grad argument. Um, so I think I, I think we I think we're, we're, we're more comfortable with our position than they are because they're scrambling and they're, they're saying anything and everything to um, to make a case which just isn't cutting through. The, I think also that um, their arguments are emotional. And one of the ones that I've heard that is completely fallacious is um, somebody supposedly went on business into Asia and was asked by an Asian, just who exactly are you Australians? We don't understand you're in Australia, but you have a queen as your head of state. Now, I, I absolutely reject that as an argument. I think that is an absolute lie. I have spent the last 15 years uh, working in Asia and traveling in Asia, and I've never had an Asian ask me my identity as an Australian as opposed to uh, being a British subject or being a subject of the Queen. So these, the, their arguments uh, are emotional, um, and they, they're very, very loose with the truth. Uh, they're quite willing to, to mislead and deceive. Tony Abbott's support of the Crown demonstrates that this is not a Protestant, others, Catholic divide. It's based on constitutional principles. I must say I had a similar experience uh, during the campaign for the Constitutional Convention I allowed, uh, I allowed them to describe me as a candidate of uh, Eurasian background. And the Sydney Morning Herald attacked me and they said, why, why did you say that? And I said, well, I never normally mention that. I don't think it's relevant. But you're saying in your newspaper all the time that monarchists are all Anglo-Protestants and only the Anglo-Protestants are interested in the constitutional monarchy. So I was just seeking to balance your erroneous reporting. She was a young, young reporter and she, she didn't counter what I was saying, nor did she report it. <laughs> or, or perhaps the editor didn't report it in the Sydney Morning Herald. Does any member of the audience wish to comment on the proposition that uh, passion and common sense are the size on the side of the constitutional monarchists. If you want to speak, you have to come down and stand there and be photographed and filmed. If not, I'd like to introduce our other young ambassador. Daniel is a young ambassador for ACM. Our other young ambassador, we have a number of them. Uh, our other young ambassador today is uh, Will Jeffries. He's here. And uh, Will, we, we have a problem, and that is that the Reverend Fred Nile has been locked into litigation. The lawyers have got him. And it's a very important case, which is going on for another two days. So he can't come. He always comes to everything he says 
he will come to. He always does whatever he says he will do. And uh, I'm going to ask Will to, Will was going to ask him a question. I'm going to ask Will to come down and uh, read the question as though Reverend Niall were here. I should introduce Will. He's an economic student. He has a superb way with words and he may well tell you about that. He also advised us quite early in the piece when he came to an early ACM annual conference, he advised us that we should be concentrating on TV, on video. And uh, that was very good advice. And we have been concentrating on that and that has done well. Will, would you like to come down and ask that uh, question? If you stand over there and face the camera, the other camera, uh, just... Will. Just... Sorry, Professor, you've given me many questions. So, obviously, Reverend Niall's not here, so I'll ask Warwick and Sean. And I forgot your name, Ken. sir. Ken, that's exactly right. Um, so... Reverend Niall was instrumental in restoring the oath of allegiance for New South Wales politicians as an alternative oath. Um, that obviously must have taken some doing. Um, so the question was, why is that important to you? And um, what's your opinion on those federal politicians who swear allegiance but try to remove the crown? Do you think their evidence be believed when they go into court and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Well, that's a good question. And thank you, Will. The question really is, why did he go to such efforts to restore the oath of allegiance in New South Wales? They'd done away with it completely. They can't do it federally without a referendum. They have to change the constitution to remove the oath. But you can do it by an act of parliament. They rammed through an act of parliament, took it away. And Fred's argument was, well, perhaps you Republicans don't want to swear allegiance to the Queen, but there are a lot of people who still want to swear allegiance to the Queen. So he put through a bill to that effect, and uh, he managed to get it through Parliament. He invited me to go along and hear the presentation of that. And that was fascinating, not only for his presentation, which I helped draft, but what was fascinating were the constant interjections. And they were interjections of no humour, no intelligence, no wit. They were silly, constant, rude interjections, and it was absolutely embarrassing. But when I got Hansard, I thought, well, at least they'll be embarrassed by what they said in Hansard. And there were, I looked at Hansard, none of them were in Hansard. I said to Fred, what's wrong with, what's happened here? All these people said these abusive, stupid things to you, and you ignored them. He said, that's the problem. If you ignore the interjections, the practices, they don't put the, those interjections into Hansard, so they save that embarrassment. And obviously the principal parties probably have an arrangement between them in Parliament. This is the, the State Parliament. Have an arrangement between them not to, uh, not to publish the interjections to show uh, people who bother looking at Hansard how stupid they are. But he did that, and it was very important. But the other part, the important part of the question... I think is also that uh, if you can't be trusted in your oath of allegiance to the Queen, you make an oath of allegiance to the Queen, which you have to do federally, and then you go and campaign, you join an organisation within Parliament, Friends of the Republic or something like that, you join this organisation, and what do you do? You breach your oath of allegiance. Now, what does that mean when you go into court? When you go into court, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Are you treating that oath of allegiance in the same way? Should every politician who changes their position on the oath of allegiance be noted so that this can be remembered? Uh, is that ridiculous or is that a reasonable conclusion? What does the panel think? Anybody on the panel who oh, has oh, a view on that? You, you go. Look, I... Um, I don't think politicians, I'm talking about the majority, not, not, not the good ones, but I don't think politicians mean much of what they say. 
Um, I, I don't think they have allegiance to, uh, they swear allegiance to the Queen, they don't mean that, they, they're supposed to serve us and they don't do that very well. Um, and you look at, is it, is it a Thorpe, a Lydia Thorpe? The, the Green Senator, the Federal Green Senator, who refused to swear the, the, the oath of allegiance mm. until she got threatened not to get paid. So my, my, my take is that politicians really are there to, as, as a self-service um, and uh, they will say and do whatever they like at election time uh, but do whatever serves themselves best uh, post that. So I'm, 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 I'm disillusioned with our politicians and I think we need to clear out. I don't think we should make too much of this. I don't think we could say that the Republic is barred by the oath of allegiance of parliamentarians. We, we take the point, but don't overstress it. There's a, there's a photograph from, of one of the English politicians taking the oath of allegiance. They photographed him from behind. <laughs> He's crossed his fingers <laughs> while he takes the oath of allegiance. Does, does the, anybody in the audience have any views on this you wish to express? Could you come down? Oh, it, it may be a bit... Uh... Daniel will show you where to go. You're the brave one. Uh, you uh, I'm uh, Robert McMahon. I'm a member of the Merchant Navy RSL and at a meeting uh, recently, very recently, uh, we were given the form to reaffirm our allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And that reminds me when I joined National Service at the age of 18, it was the same form with a difference. The form I signed had the word king crossed out and the word queen inserted. But um, when it comes to the governor general, are we going to be allegiance, show allegiance to the governor general or allegiance to the queen? And how does this refer to organizations like the uh, RSL? Well, the allegiance is to the Queen, not to the Governor-General, it's to the Crown. Is that not right, Ken? Yes. No, I don't think you have allegiance to the Governor-General. No, no. You mean no, the President? I, I have a lot you, of... You mean if we became a republic? Uh, like, going forward in Australia, uh, in the forces, will we be swearing allegiance to the Governor-General or to the Queen? That's my question. We will still swear allegiance to the Queen, who is above politics right. and continues, whether it's a Labour government or a Liberal government or a coalition government. That's the whole point about the Crown. It deprives the politicians of the status of being the head of state. OK, I, thank you. I fully agree with that same position as myself. Good, thank you. Yes. John Armfield. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to pick up Ken Handley's point. I don't think it's something which we ought to bang on a bit about for, even though I'm a supporter of the oath, and the reasons are, I think it was Cardinal Wolsey, Cardinal, uh, Ken will remind me if I'm right, when he was asked whether he could swear an oath, he said, before I do, I have to see what are its terms. If you read the terms of the oath, I don't think a Republican should have any trouble in swearing it. The oath is to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Australia, her heirs and successors according to law. And I emphasise the last words. I don't think there's any Republican that I'm aware of who proposes um, a republic which wouldn't be lawful. And it would, as a matter of statutory definition, a republic would be a successor, it may not be an heir. So the point I always make to Republicans, there are a couple of things. Firstly, you need to read the terms of the oath. I don't think there's any problem. I, if I were a Republican, I wouldn't have a problem in swearing such an oath. That's the first thing. The second thing, we as constitutional monarchists 
no doubt come from different positions as to the reasons for supporting the system. I've got a number of reasons. The first is the system. We've had good monarchs, we've had bad monarchs, we'll have good monarchs and bad monarchs in the future. But what is important is the system, which is an Australian system, which works for us. That's the primary reason I support it. I'm also a constitutional monarchist. I don't mind telling everyone. I like all the paraphernalia which goes on with the Crown. I don't see any reason to retreat from that. It's something I enjoy. I think most republics lack all of that. They lack the continuity, they lack the interest, they lack the, the fact that there's someone who personifies the state. We shouldn't be embarrassed to say that. So the proposition I would put to you is that, yes, um, we should, Retaining the oath, uh, it's, uh, particularly since it's an option, I think is good. But I don't think it really serves our cause to go around to saying to people, um, you wouldn't be believed in court or something like that. Uh, because the fact of the matter is that uh, the oath in its terms doesn't preclude people from having a conscientious objection. So I think we, we are proud of the fact that we put our case accurately and fairly and I think we should, we should do that. We shouldn't take points which are not accurate. Thank you, John. John, could I ask you a question? Uh, where would you have been in 1688? With the Glorious Revolution? Yes, when, uh, when you had a revolutionary situation. Um, that's always a difficult question uh, to answer for two reasons. I suppose, well, I'll give you a direct answer. Um, I, I probably, on balance, would have been in favour uh, of the Orangeman. Um, but it's, yeah, in favour of William. Um, you want an explanation? I'm yeah, happy to give yes. it briefly. Yes. Uh, um, the reason why I think it's not an easy question to answer is as a general proposition, um, certainly in the 20th and 21st century, I am a believer in constitutional systems. So the idea of um, overturning, albeit by fairly peaceful means, uh, an existing system is not one which has immediate attraction to me. However, I think that with the benefit of, not only of retrospect, but of what happened then, um, the Glorious Revolution did, as a matter of practicality, enshrine rights in Britain, which have subsequently come to Australia, and if it had not occurred, those rights, at least at that time, maybe later, would not have existed. So that's a rather long way of giving the answer. I've given a direct answer, but that's the reasoning behind it. It's a fascinating question for constitutional monarchists, because uh, just to remind you that James II was the legal, legitimate king, but he was... He fled England. He was trying to impose an absolute monarchy like that of Louis XIV onto the English who didn't want that. He, w he thought he had a power to make or at least suspend laws. He had a dispensing power. He fled England. The, the parliament then invited his daughter and her husband, William and Mary. He, the husband was the... Uh, was the uh, stadtholder in the Dutch Republic. I think it was still called a Republic, but it was an hereditary position. Invited them to come across to be the King and Queen, subject to their agreeing to a Bill of Rights, which set out the conditions of this, subject to their effectively agreeing in future that legislation could only be made by the King in Parliament, or the que King and Queen in Parliament, the king had no separate legislative role, but the king and queen would still be the formal executive with some influence until, some considerable influence in the running of the government in that the ministers were responsible more to the king than to parliament. But it was a revolutionary situation because people were swearing allegiance to a king and queen who were not really the legitimate kings and queens, if you looked at the constitution 
as it was. So it was a, that's why it's called the Glorious Revolution. So it's a little difficult for constitutional monarchists. And you did have Jacobeans and uh, bishops, I think, in the Church of England who refused to accept the new king and queen. It, it's very interesting for constitutional monarchists. I think I would have been on the side of William and Mary because James II was proposing something which was unacceptable. That is an absolute monarchy which will always eventually be a failure and is not the way to govern a country as we see in, uh, in the People's Republic of China. I wanted to, in the, in the final part of this session, to come to some of the other themes. One of the other themes of this conference is how to recognize the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And it's an extraordinary event. And the Queen has rendered really wonderful service, not only to Britain, but to the whole Commonwealth and to the world. She has been a superb sovereign. And the fact that she has reigned for so long, 70 years next year, should be recognized in some special way. And we proposed, and I wrote to the Prime Minister about it, a Platinum Jubilee Medal. In other words, it wouldn't be a, a statue, it wouldn't be something for the royal family, some special gift. It would be something from the Queen to those who had rendered selfless service. And uh, we described that as those who'd served in our defence in fighting bushfires, floods and the pandemic, in the hospitals, in life-saving for our protection and in so, uh, so many other ways for the nation. People who were not already recognised but who had rendered what we said was selfless service and to a large number of people because there are a large number of people who have rendered selfless service. So it wouldn't be a medal to be given to the public service or to, to uh, generals or to judges or people in authority. It was to those who'd rendered selfless service. And we put that up to the Prime Minister haven't had a reply yet. And there's a lovely, a lovely design which uh, Sean suggested, which was, is in one of the, uh, if you go to our Facebook, you'll find it there. There's, a, there's a, uh, a petition there for it. And I wonder what people think, how should we best celebrate in Australia this extraordinary event? Of course, there'll be something over the Queen's birthday weekend, but we suggest something a little more. We've previously had a medal, I think, for the Silver Jubilee. We didn't have one for the Gold or Diamond Jubilee in Australia. Uh, I think John Howard took the view that the Gold one was too close to the Centenary Medal, and he wouldn't do that, and we didn't have one for the Diamond Jubilee. They do have them in Britain, but it would seem appropriate that we have a special one. We made the point of it also being wearable, not one of those medals that you get you have it in a little box and you put it in a cupboard somewhere and it's never seen again, something which could be worn as a medal. And I'm wondering what, uh, what people think of that. And if they agree with it, what we can do to promote it. David, do you know personally a member of parliament who could ask the question of the prime minister, what, what he's gonna do about our petition? I think we have one coming today. Craig Kelly could ask the prime minister about that. Whether the Prime Minister would take great notice, I don't know. But I, I think that's a good idea. We should get a Member of Parliament on side. Make it, um, you, you're right there, that's, a, that's one way to assist it. Get a Member of Parliament to treat it as his or her particular mission, one of her missions of achievement. Should try to do it on both sides if we can find a, a Labour politician too. Uh, it's, it's a very good idea, I think. The, as, De as Professor Flint said, there was a Silver Jubilee Medal, and I was serving in the British Army at the time, and the medal was um, portioned out um, in, in very small numbers uh, in, in the ranks of the British Armed Forces. I don't know whether civil servants or politicians received the medal, 
but um, only two or three medals were awarded into each battalion, and that was generally the CO, the RSM, and then possibly the youngest private, or I've, I've no idea. But there was a great deal of, of rancor about this because most people wanted to be given the medal, and they didn't receive it. Um, I, I think the, the idea that it goes to people who have demonstrated selfless service is, is an ideal situation. One of the things that I, one of the uh, things that I think about the honours system, if you look at the honours system um, every, every, or twice a year, New Year's honours and Queen's birthday list honours, um, it's always well-known characters who are, who are honoured um, and perhaps deservedly in some cases, but I would think that there are very many people um, who are not well known, who have done selfless service, who are, who are not known and who are not recognized. And so a change in the system of, of, of recognition, I think, or of, of understanding who, who is out there needs to be done. R otherwise, it's going to be a, a, a very similar process, I think, to the current honors, uh, honors and awards system where um, it is very much the senior people. Uh, as an example, we're supposed to be democratic. Um, there's supposed to be equality. There's been a change in the military decorations. Even the United Kingdom has taken officers' decorations and made them available to all ranks. Um, and obviously, an officer's decoration for gallantry also includes leadership. Um, so that has occurred. But nevertheless, when you look at here in Australia, which is supposedly more democratic, um, the people who receive the top honours are the top people. And I want to see an RSM or a sergeant major awarded an Australia, the AC um, and, or an AO rather than being further down the list. And um, so I think this is, a, this is an issue and it needs to be addressed. But otherwise, I'm for a uh, Platinum Jubilee medal and uh, I would hope that it goes, that the people can be identified, people who have um, provided selfless service. Uh, will be identified and honoured. Good. I, I like, likewise, uh, David, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a good idea. Um, I mean, I get excited watching, watching the, the Queen's, what was it, the last one, the, the, the Diamond Jubilee. I, I understand the Prime Minister's already come out and said he's not looking to celebrate um, the Platinum Jubilee. Um, I may be wrong there, but I think I've seen something about that. My, my issue is does it need to be government organised? I mean, is, there, is there a mechanism for an organisation like this dealing directly with Buckingham House, or is that, uh, is that undermining the...? the, the we, certainly, we could do it. I think Daniel has some, a comment on this. Uh, well, you, I was, Sean, I was just about to actually mention uh, that. Could you...? I was just about to actually mention. Whether the Prime Minister or not decides to celebrate this. I think this is our golden ticket for bringing the youth in. And I've had a conversation with a number of people who are very concerned about the number of young people attending events like this. So I think the Platinum Jubilee, for sure, is our golden ticket to showcase what the monarchy is about, to showcase what the, our constitutional system is about, and also a chance for all Australians, whether you're a Republican or you're a monarchist, to unite and celebrate 70 years of service. So I think, um, one, Australians for Constitutional Monarchy, and I think Professor Flink can uh, confirm, we have written a letter to the Prime Minister and we are awaiting a reply. But I think also members of ACM maybe should take the liberty as well to write to their local MP expressing their concern about uh, not the government not taking a stance on celebrating this. I think as far as the medal goes, I think it's a fantastic idea. But I also think there's, we should do more to celebrate not only the medal. I think maybe uh, the military should, could become involved the same way a birthday parade is done with Trooping of the Colour. I think um, a military parade for the uh, Platinum Jubilee will be great. A multi-faith service maybe, the same sort of uh, idea that's done in the United Kingdom could be one idea. But my question as well is what could we do like what Sean was saying, us as ACM and members of the panel, anyone in the audience as well, what can we do maybe if the Prime Minister won't celebrate the Platinum Jubilee, what's our plan B? Because I think this event is far too important just to say, okay, we're going to miss it then. 
Yes. A, co a concert, maybe. I, my idea was a, a concert, but... My name's Malcolm Little. Um, regarding the medal, there was a golden jubilee and a diamond jubilee produced in the UK. Unfortu I think it's unfortunate that it was given out too liberally. Anyone in any of the emergency services or armed services who had served for five years got the medal. So everyone's wearing the medal. The Platinum, Diamond, Platinum uh, Jubilee Medal has already been designed in the UK. Um, the ribbon is similar to the Coronation Medal. The Canadians haven't decided what they're going to do, but normally they do their own thing. They will produce a medal. Um, it will be slightly different in design from the British one, but it hasn't officially been announced. I think the idea of a medal is a good idea. I think that, um, I remember you, Warwick, you spoke about the 77 Jubilee and that was given on, on, a, on a ration basis so that a, a military unit, an army unit, navy unit, whatever, were given um, three. So the CO, the RSM and a junior soldier got one. I actually heard of somebody, the newest recruit, had just been posted to the unit and they were sitting in the orderly room working out who was going to get the third medal and they said, well, the next bloke who walks through the door gets the medal. And it was the new recruit turning up and he got a medal. So I, I don't agree with that. Something along the way that the centenary medal was, was, uh, pr was awarded, I think that's a good idea. I know that in my local council area, um, each councillor had the ability to nominate one person for the award. The mayor had an extra one up, up his or her sleeve they were not supposed to nominate each other. Two councillors did uh, and got the, got the centenary medal. But I think it, it, on that, that, that way of, of, of nominating people is not a bad idea. Um, I, think, I think the idea of a, of a medal is a good one, but it shouldn't be handed out with the rations. I think it should be for people who have demonstrated um, volunteering, um, contrib contribution to the society. Um, and that's about all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any further? I, yes. Just one point I'd make. I think that it has to be uh, properly authorised by the government in order that it can be worn. Otherwise, um, it's going to be seen as, uh, as just a, one of these medals that are, that are called out by the, uh, these various organisations that... that um, take down people for stolen valour and stolen, stolen honour. So it, needs, it, it does need the stamp of, of approval from the government, I think. Yes. Um, and practically um, speaking, it should be done by the Honour Secretariat because it would be a big organisation across the whole country to decide who should be given this centenary, this platinum medal. And we can't set up a parallel organisation. We should use the one we've already got in the Honour Secretariat, run by the Governor-General. Yes. I'm Michael Copeman. Good morning. Um, I make four points based on what speakers have said. First of all, I think it should just be the Queen's Medal. Don't put Platinum Jubilee in it. It starts to sound like it's not as good as other things. Queen's Medal for a, a very um, honest day-to-day -day person really stands out. Um, secondly, in all the non-for-profit institutions around Australia, hospitals, schools, educational institutions, I would leave out government in general. Uh, let's make it democratic where the people who work there get to vote, but it's not for their leaders and so on. It's for somebody they know who works within the institution and each institution, depending on size, gets one. So it's a celebration for that institution of recognition this person wouldn't get. But I totally agree, it needs probably a ceremony, the Opera House forecourt, all of the people there, all awarded on one day, that will be on TV, it will gain exactly the publicity you need. Whereas to hand them out individually or to make it local governments and so on, I think, takes away from it. Thank you. I don't know whether other people in the room are in contact with their local member, but I think if each one of us in, in contact with our local member we would write about the, about the Platinum Medal. We'd set up a, a real wave of support in, in the party meeting, which would force the Prime Minister to act. 
The uh, post on this on Facebook reached 43,000 people, and a number of them signed, not, not 43,000, but a, a number did sign a petition. We have a petition on change.org for this, and that was quite a few people. Obviously, we should, I think the feeling is we should continue to do this. I'm wondering whether, Ken, we shouldn't also informally approach the Governor General. Uh, having the Governor General on side, I mean, he can't decide, but having a Governor General saying to a Prime Minister, uh, this is not a bad idea, could help. Should we do that? Should we speak to <coughs> vice regal officials? No stone unturned. <laughs> no stone unturned. So I think, I think there's a lot of wisdom there. So, yes. Oh. yes. <laughs> this is a bit of a crazy idea, but I don't know how many of you have heard about, I think his name is Jack, a fiver for a farmer. If you've listened to 2GB, he's raised millions. What I'm getting at here, what about we get some young person to start pushing for something like this? That's a bit... There's a lot of young people in the world and I've blah, blah, blah. You've heard of some of them and they've got a bit of voice out there. So why don't we use one to get this up and running? Thank you. Well, we do have a young... We have young people <laughs> over there. They, they are statutorily young and they are, they are uh, ambassadors for ACM. Should you choose to accept this mission? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've reached uh, the end of this session because I see... Two very important, yes. Would anyone in the room who's in touch with their local member or senator put their hand up? I suppose state uh, members should also be approached too, should they not? Indeed. If each one of us who put their hand up were to be in touch with a local member or local senator, that would create a momentum behind this idea. <laughs>